Hello, everyone, and welcome. Love technical issues, you know, it makes life interesting. Uh, thanks for being here. Today we have Juliet Erickson, who's going to talk about her new book, The Nimble Negotiator. Glad you're here. Um, the book club is a little bit different, as you may know if you've participated in different or in uh, previous ones, in that we really don't do slides. It's intended to be live and interactive and video if you're so willing. Uh, <laughs> and clearly, we are crazy pioneers because here we are on video and uh, no one has fallen over dead. So anyway. Uh, excited about this, looking forward to uh, your participation, your questions, comments, thoughts, whatever. Uh, and then I guess we will turn it over to Kelly, who will introduce Juliet. And then, Juliet, if you can just kind of, you know, set the stage, uh, tell us about how this book came about or uh, however you'd like to sort of frame it. And I think we've already got some some questions uh, lined up because I think people are pretty into this book. I know that uh, when I think of negotiating, I think, <gasps> okay, whatever you want. <laughs> so, and, and I should have never said that, of course, because now it's on recording. Anyway, <laughs> Kelly, would you please introduce, introduce Juliet? Hey, today we have Juliet Erickson. Juliet is an executive coach coach, communication specialist, and author. She consults to international corporate executives and individuals who want to see their dreams, ideas, and projects come to fruition. She's also had three books published, The Art of Persuasion, Nine Ways to Walk Around a Boulder, and the one we're discussing today, The Nimble Negotiator, Beat Negotiation at Its Own Game. And we're very pleased to have her here today. So, Julia? Thank you very much, Kelly. Michael, I really appreciate this. This is a, a, a pioneering um, experience, really. It's nice to have so many faces and so many questions. And good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are out there. I know we have visitors from as far afield as Germany today. Um, so welcome, everyone. I think um, I'm excited about this being kind of open plan. Um, I had hoped uh, today to perhaps give you a little bit of an answer to the question about why this book, why now? So in case you'd like to dive into it, what will you get from it? Um, and then also perhaps some some tips, um, some things that, uh, questions I often get asked as well and things that might be helpful so that by the end of this session you can go away and do something different or even at least think about negotiating a little bit differently. So that's Absolutely. my goal and I'm, I'm open to any other goals you might have as well Wonderful. about this. Yeah, I guess I, as I was thinking about it, um, I was thinking, you know, negotiation. I guess the first thing I think of when I think of negotiation is a job interview. But really, negotiation is so much more than that. It, it's, you know, as, as you, it's, it's, it's everything you do every day, whether it's talking to your spouse or, you know, trying to get something done um, and hopefully creating a win-win as opposed to, you know, my way or the highway. Uh. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that too because part of the reason why I wrote the book was because I, over the years I've been doing this for, you believe it, it's now almost 30 years and I have um, not seen a whole lot change in the area of negotiation. You're quite right. People are quite tense about it. It feels for some reason like a competition. Um, there are, there's so much angst around it and it seems that the people winning in fact in negotiations have been the ones that kind of subscribe to an old school uh, competition where the feeling is oh gosh there's so much for me to lose if I get this wrong and um, because as part of my coaching effort I spend so much time you know, coaching people through high stakes negotiations I get involved with the whole team and the leader of that team and I can just see the, the pain and anguish about it Part of that is because we feel like we negotiate all the time. Um, but in fact, I'd like to argue that, that we don't negotiate as much as we think we do. And that most of us, in fact, we're part of a big fat club which says most of us don't do it very well either. And I think it's for part of the, that, that reason. So in, in the book, I try to 
to just help us get our head around it a little bit. And, and the, the word nimble really captures what I mean by that. Um, and so if we, if we like the idea that, okay, we don't negotiate all that much. It feels like we negotiate all the time, but we actually don't. And that we don't do it very well. Let's examine this a little more closely then. What does that all mean? I, um, I teach a class at Stanford University every year, a couple of classes in negotiation. And part of that is um, asking people when they join the class, why are you here? And tell me about how and when and why you negotiate. And I find that after spending time listening to people tell me why they're there and what they actually do negotiate, I find that they're not really negotiating at all. Sometimes something as simple as a job interview needs to have clarity first around whether or not that job's the right one or whether they're speaking to the right person or issues around the criteria of whether that job's right for them. Hmm. Sometimes it requires a, a different kind of communication altogether before negotiation is even considered. And so, again, once we uncover that, it's, gee, maybe I'll just go have a conversation with this person first. And very often when they do and they get the clarity or the clarification that they need, they find, gee, this wasn't what I was gearing up for at all. So that idea is kind of liberating, really, um, so that nimble means not only being prepared for what you will inevitably discover during a negotiation, because there's, frankly, um, no way to plan for everything, by the way, big secret, <laughs> um, but it's also something that... Um, once you seek clarity or you have clarification as your main goal, you find it's usually something else. Hmm. The second part is that if it is a real negotiation and you decide exactly, yes, let's press the go button on negotiation, um, now I've got to figure out if I am negotiating, negotiating what's it about, actually. Um, there are some wonderful tools for actually getting the negotiation right, so planning and understanding the, the flow of a negotiation and how people use tactics and so on. Hmm. So that first part of clarification has been a bit of um, an epiphany because people go, I didn't realize it. it's actually not a negotiation. And then second, if I'm going, there is huge opportunity for me to prepare well for it. Hmm. So that's yeah. what nimble is about. It's, it should say the liberated negotiator <laughs> instead <laughs> of the nimble negotiator. Yeah, I, I guess I think, you know, sort of, I don't even know who's saying it is, but, you know, seek first to understand and then to be understood, um, I think. Is yeah, certainly what, what definitely. You, yeah. What and, and there's about. a kind of, it's interesting, there's a sort of fatigue um, that inspired me to write this as well, because people are a little wary or tired of um, the, the outcomes that come from those kind of highly competitive um gearing up to compete sort of old school negotiations. It's tiring. I'm mm -hmm. sure there are some um, areas of business particularly where this kind of aggressive and competitive um, negotiating may still be the flavor of the month. Um, but that fatigue is moving more towards this idea of building rapport with the people you're negotiating with, seeking bigger pies. And in fact, if, if you're interested, the, I should say even Harvard, um, the, the most uh, the sort of trendsetters and groundbreakers in ne negotiating studies and research, most of what they're writing about now, particularly on their blog, which is accessible to everyone, this is mm -hmm. a negotiation project in, in Stanford uh, at uh, Harvard. Um, they're writing most of their articles are about the better outcomes that come from seeking clarity and and rapport. So wow. we're writing a wonderful trend. That, that is encouraging. I, I yes. still remember one of my first jobs, um, the somebody in the office saying, oh, Madeline just took a, uh, a two-day intensive on negotiation, so I'd really stay out of her office if I were you. <laughs> so, that was scary. It was really scary. <laughs> it was really scary. <laughs> well, wouldn't it be nice to walk away from the idea of negotiating, feeling like you have a little more power Mm. in that negotiation and a lot less stress mm. and the power I promise on my heart comes from uh, taking or having the courage to clarify what what it is that you're doing there not only does it surprise people 
um, when instead of gearing up to start swapping, well, I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do this, before mm -hmm. any of that starts, it's about to say, well, why don't we just talk a little bit more about why we're here? Can I just explore how you feel about this and so on? In fact, I read an article this morning uh, about there's some brand new research hot off the press about how food is being used in competitive negotiation situations to kind of distract and help people focus on each other rather than on negotiating as such. Again, another Harvard study. And she was <laughs> suggesting tapas, but I'm not sure if that. <laughs> but the idea that we just sit down as human beings and it's okay to negotiate, but before we do, let's do our duty. Let's do Let's honor the negotiation first by understanding it and clarifying mm -hmm. it and understanding each other before we do it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that much extra time and the outcomes are enormous. Oh, that sounds it's great. It's so much better. Yeah, it's sort of take away that blank, you know, tabletop with a piece of paper with your goals and make it a much, just a, a much more pleasant environment. That sounds... That sounds well, brilliant. Does. And 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 don't mistake clarification for niceness. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm I'm dealing with a formidable opponent and so on. In fact, clarification is very powerful. And it takes a lot more grit. And there's that I love that word. It's kind of getting popular at the moment, this word grit. Mm -hmm. But it does take a lot more grit um, and even humility to clarify first. Excellent. So uh, there is a, a chapter on the book, uh, in the book on on how to do that, how to have something that I like to call a reconnaissance conversation, before you even submit to deciding that you're going to negotiate, and it it involves you um, genuinely learning about again why we're there. It helps you set an objective. It helps you uncover whether or not your own objectives or your own desires out of the negotiation are enough because so often we know what to uh, uh, to give but we don't know what we can get yeah that's an excellent point and it's really true so it's again just this this idea of clarifying um, helps also um, the other side or the people that you're intending or thinking you need to negotiate clarify their own understanding of the context um, and earlier we had a, um, one of your uh, readers or our listeners from Germany had asked a question mm -hmm. about um, Gregory Bates and comments about how, how people see the text and forget about the context. Um, maybe another way to say that is not being able to see the forest through the trees. Mm -hmm. This often happens in negotiation. We get so fixated on what we need to go back to the office with or perhaps what our perception is of our own value or the, the value of a job or a certain outcome that we, I think, often missed out on something much bigger and better. So yes, I am asking uh, my readers and, and our negotiators to go to the table with the light <coughs> on your side. <laughs> Very Leave well. The dark. It's too much work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah. Kelly, do you have some, some questions? Not necessarily you personally, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kelly, what did, is it? <laughs> did, did Mark want to be unmuted? Uh, sure, we can un unmute. Okay, him. and before I unmute him, just to everybody, anyone can be unmuted. This is more of a discussion than us just you know, talking at you. So, oh yeah, if yes, you're please. really I brave, love questions. just raise your hand, and we will unmute you. And if you're sort of brave, you can type your question in, and, and we'll just read it to Juliet for you. So please, please feel free to participate. Yeah, and I would love to, to have your situations or comments, or if any of you have already read the book. Yeah. Um, it hasn't been out very long, but um, I'm, my students are using it, and they're having a great time with it, which is a huge relief. Excellent. Well, there we have Mark. I can see you, Mark. Yeah. Can you hear me too? We can hear you too. Yeah, hi, Mark. Okay. Hello, Mark. I think my question to Juliet has already been answered. So I can add some remarks. And I hope that this book finds 
many readers because they can really uh, discover a kind of different relationship if they go into negotiation, they might discover that their opponent may look like a not 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 an enemy, but perhaps a friend. And this is if you look at the context. Uh, in the past, most uh, introductions to negotiations were about winning. I think we live in such a complex world that winning and defeating the other part mm -hmm. is not a solution for the future in a complex world. And I am very happy when I read the book, my impression was oh, there is somebody who thinks about changing the context. And uh, I, I wonder uh, if other people who have looked into the book or who have thought about changing their understanding of negotiation somehow feel similar things or have had similar impressions. I think that's a, Thank you. an excellent question. Um, if I might comment while we're waiting for someone or um, when you, uh, there you are. We lost you for a second, but you're back. Bit, am I okay? Am I okay now? I yep. was having a it was telling me in the Silicon Valley I'm having a slow connection problem. Who Seems knew? So wrong. <laughs> 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 um, one of the things that I have, I feel blessed, um, you know, it's always one of those things when you put a book out there to see what comes back. And and I, the most important thing to me is that I can help change the lives of the people who read it and who work with me. And I, I have noticed so far that my students are coming in with one idea about what they think negotiation is. And there's a lot of stress and tension around that. And are leaving with uh, the idea that their perspective has changed and they, they are convinced because it sounds pretty scary at first, for example, to say it's, it's okay to go first in a negotiation and it's even desirable to go first. You know the old fashioned just sit back and wait until they say something and then you can pounce or don't do anything until you know what the other side's going to do. When in fact, the truth about that, research shows us that, that actually going first or even anchoring the tone and anchoring the communication, sort of setting the scene for it is a very powerful way to facilitate the negotiation. So there are some things which are kind of flipping people's understanding or uh, fixing the context, as Mark said, um, and it does involve engaging earlier in clarification, even before you negotiate, accepting that it may not be a negotiation, no matter what anybody says, it may well not be. And also, in doing all of this, it gives you more clarity about your own situation, and as Mark said, maybe even an opportunity to <clears throat> build an ally with someone with whom you thought perhaps might be an opponent. And this is happening through the stories my students are telling me. Mm -hmm. So it's ancient wisdom, of course. There's no new news in the world. <laughs> but it is certainly uh, an, an encouragement. I'm putting this in your face and saying, do it. The results are positive. <coughs> Pardon me. The results are positive, and it's, and it's happening for people. So Excellent. thank you for that. It's important, Mark. Thank yeah. you. Mark, if you would like... Uh, let me add something which is very actual. We just have had the elections for the European presidency. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues has been the discussions between the European community and the United States about the new trade uh, uh, 
freight uh, uh, TTIL, I think it's called, very complicated name. The strategy has been to keep these things secret. Mm -hmm. And this, for me, is a good example how you can somehow be destructive already in the very beginning. And what happened, uh, it became an issue in the fight of the elections uh, and clarification would have been a great lesson for all participants somehow to create a world where exchange is better and possible and uh, it is an exchange where you are not forced into traps. Uh, the impression of many people uh, in these elections was, and it was taken up by the politicians, oh, they are going to cheat you, they don't tell you what reality is, there is no clarification. I think this is a very, very uh, actual uh, example how you can miss that context of clarification and you see the results. It is uncertain what the outcome will be. At least the politicians will have to work very, very hard to uh, regain this kind of space which they have lost based on their strategy of keeping things unclear, the contrary of clarification. Yeah, yeah. And this happens also on a micro level with us every day. So when we say we negotiate all the time, we may think we're doing that, but maybe it means just having the courage to take a step back. Sometimes it may only be seconds, um, sometimes a little longer, to even ask the question, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that, or can you, can you explain that a little bit further before you engage or jump in um, to what you might think is a negotiation, and then have to sort of claw back much later um, things that you've said or promised that you may have made or things that may not be very well thought through. Um, so clarification actually shortens the time it takes to get things done, even though it may feel like it's an extra step. You know, as Mark was talking, I was thinking, uh, I think in general, um, when, you, when you put your foot in or your toe into the uh, political stuff, uh, they're generally speaking, never fair to make generalizations, uh, they're pretty much poster child children for how not to. Uh, the whole idea is to, it seems to me, to create confusion and um, ensure a lack of clarification. But maybe that's just me. I live near, near D.C., so I, <laughs> I certainly see a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I, I think we need to build into the system, um, again, not only accountability but a value for clarity or a value around clarity, because clarity is kind of scary. I, I don't think we'd have an awful lot to do if things were clearer. That's true. You know, to me, it's like, where would, where would it all go? <laughs> what would yeah. we have time to do? Gee. Um, and it's quite confronting, clarification. But confrontation is a good thing. You know, again, over the years, we have, have seen confrontation as something that is a little uncomfortable, and we often avoid it. Um, when in fact it's a, it's not only an invitation, but it, it's, um, it's sort of like you know maybe for some pulling pulling the bandaid off really quickly instead of slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but but clarification is this thing I would love us to sort of um, introduce into our communication, particularly, but also in particular to our negotiation. Of course, it's another form of communication, I suppose. <laughs> I was just going to say, of course, there'd be no more talk radio because there'd be no reason for it. Ah. <laughs> well, we can look at it as a process of clarification. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's like, what would we do if things were clear? Yeah, in our dreams. We'd be relaxed. <laughs> right. We can, move, we can move towards that, I think. Okay. 
Mm. I'll, uh, I'll get right on I get that. another idea when I'm uh, following this introduction. Uh, Michaela uh, is quite close to the health sector mm -hmm, and yeah. uh, patient, doctor-patient relationships are a field where I think we could improve enormously if the experts who are the owners of clarity and they have to deal to deal with just silly patients could think about what change in effectiveness they could achieve if they take up another kind of context where they meet each other for clarification. Hmm. Uh, this has not been an outspoken issue in the relationship in uh, the field of health, healthcare medicine between experts and consumers. But I think uh, we should uh, look at, at this issue specifically in this field. Juliet, your book did not address this specifically, but I think uh, we should uh, look for possibilities to teach health ex experts the lessons or the, the, the different possibilities of understanding what a nimble negotiator or a nimble expert may be able to do, may be able to achieve in a negotiation with his patient where clarification is the issue or one of the, the, the main issues. Yes, and, and it's interesting now, at least my experience here in California and working with clients, particularly in um, the healthcare sector, um, not so much in the hospital, but in drug development and so on, I, I, um, I see that what's happening is a return to the Hippocratic Oath in advertising and branding where we have um, major hospital groups um, talking about human kindness mm. and talking mm -hmm. about um, physicians as, as friends and empathy and listening and, and so on. And on the other hand, we have a system that is still uh, forcing concierge medicine if you want more than than 15 minutes with your physician you have to pay in a different way and the the regular general practitioner visit of 3.2 minutes um, mm -hmm. the, the system is in a lot of flux mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of at least in my experience a lot of new conversations happening between doctor patient but they mm -hmm. are being taught bedside manner that's the level uh, where it is at the moment, and, and it's not a bad place to start for those of us that have ex experienced a bad bedside manner. Mm -hmm. um, but the accountability, because being nimble and seeking clarity requires accountability and responsibility for not only information you seek, but what you receive as well. So well, that wasn't too complex opinion, but I, I see it happening on so many levels, and you're right. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I think it's desperately needed. I wonder if there might be a uh, sort of uh, physician's desk reference for communication, negotiation, clarity in your future. Maybe just a little one they could keep with them and uh, remind them that uh, they are human dealing with humans. No mm -hmm. bias. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no bias whatsoever. I mean, I, I think everyone, uh, again, just in my own experience, I see physicians um, being um, at least more able through the use of technology and the electronic records and, and markets probably quite different in Germany, but there are movements toward helping the physician understand the patient more. I'm not sure of, of if there are a lot of sort of rules and regulations and policies governing all of that, but um, and it, you know, with respect to physicians, I'm sure there are many who care deeply and wish the system was different. 
uh, it's certainly not supporting them now. No, that's mm. for sure. Mm. Kelly? Thank you for that, Mark. Yeah, actually, I had a question in the beginning of the book, and you keep referring to people don't know that they're in a negotiation. So what mm. what is the difference between an argument and a negotiation? Well, uh, a, a negotiation is, um, uh, let's just say, uh, an interaction between two people over who gets what, to put simply. So it's at that point where we're discussing a value um, of something that we're getting ready to exchange. Whereas an, an argument, technically speaking, is a, a, a form. It's a, it's a, a, a structure, a format, a, a way of discussing. Um, now, when you're talking, Kelly, did you mean a heated argument? Um, uh, you know, one where we're disagreeing with each other, or um, is, is that what you mean? It's, I think that's a, they, they both have high levels of emotion, potentially, but uh, one is yeah, just the volume somebody thinks it's a negotiation, a and you're thinking, maybe this is an argument. Yeah, and it could be, in fact, in the middle of an argument, um, perhaps uh, stopping for clarification could be a good idea. It's all very hard. I would imagine that the emotional quotient in a, uh, an argument hopefully is not, if the negotiation is calm and organized and well-structured, um, and hopefully more like a discussion or a conversation, whereas an argument, I think as we're defining it here, Kelly, is more... Um, where people are disagreeing emotionally on an issue at a particular uh, stress level. Hmm. Would that be fair? Yeah. yeah. My favorite example was the negotiating with your teenager, do they really have a choice? Yeah. I thought that was funny. No, they don't. <laughs> well, no, and you're right. I, no. I often want to ask parents. I, I, I'm not an expert on teenagers, but sometimes I see them negotiating about things which are now, just a minute. <laughs> Hold on a second. Is this really a negotiation? Mm. And remember, a negotiation is a, a perhaps a higher order communication where we have consented between us to be apportioning value to each. Um, and I like to keep it at higher order and also consensual because so often in old school negotiating, I, I feel ripped or manipulated mm -hmm. um, and that's just not a long-term way to live it's it and I guess anybody that believes in that stuff coming back to you which it, it does it you know in this complex world as Mark said it's not a way to to work with people it's not the way to make your own pie larger or even go from a pie to something else I mean we close ourselves off to that if we negotiate that way. So how can you flip that? How can you, I'm sorry, Kelly, did I interrupt? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. How, how can you sort of from having that normal sort of horse mule, horse mule kind of thing, how can you reasonably introduce that kind of change into maybe a relationship that hasn't been so negotiation or negotiating mm. prone? Yeah. And and um, I think Mark is probably more of a relationship expert than me. I wish I had I had the uh, as a relationship expert. But I think I think <clears throat> part of being a good and nimble negotiator is raising your own self awareness. And if you recognize a habit that that continues to repeat itself, it may be worth. Uh, examining perhaps a way to, as you said, flip it somehow. Um, you may have to listen to someone in a way that you never have before, perhaps like you don't know them. I had a, a client the other day who is having difficulty with uh, his board members. And there he felt constantly abused, in fact, in board meetings. Uh, the board was sort of kind of hammering, interrupting him and then two or three of them would get going, and he was um, just, just having a lot of, uh, he felt beaten up by the end of his board meetings. And so I was called in to say, you know, help me, help me get on better with these people, because this has been going on for months, and everybody was getting a little bit embarrassed, and it became a very bad habit. 
Um, so we helped him increase his self-awareness, realized that when he was um, with the board, he wasn't very well prepared. In fact, he had no rapport with any of the individual board members. Um, some of the flipping for him involved meeting with individuals beforehand. So something he'd never done was even just to call and seek advice from a particular board member on another issue. Take another out to coffee and pre-wire, I like to say, say, tell them this is coming, how do you feel about this? So just building a rapport with them was his way of flipping it. Um, sometimes if you're in a close relationship where you think you know each other very well, you may need to take it outside your usual conversation place. Maybe you have to acknowledge it's not going the way you'd like it to go. And I've had someone even do so much as to go on a walk with a person. It was different. It, it changed the physical. It changed mm. the habit that kept repeating itself. It can be sometimes as simple um, as that. Mm. Not always so simple. Um, there's often another thing which I like to call a, a mismatch or a communication mismatch where a disagreement can go on for a long time. And there's information about this also in the book. And you realize after clarification that perhaps you're talking, it sounds like you're talking about the same thing, but your understanding of the context of it is different. So you need to, again, it's about listening a little more carefully, but understanding and go back over what you actually do think about this or feel about it. And often it's about exploring feelings, hmm. defining what you mean by certain things. And very often you go, oh my gosh, we're not talking, we're talking about the same thing, but we don't mean the same thing. So there's this increase in awareness and diving again into um, an effort at clarification all helps flip that stuff. And sometimes something as simple as a physical shift can mm -hmm. do it. Did that address your question specifically? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's funny, as you said, as you said, you know, take it outside. My first thought was go for a walk and yeah, I think there you're was. right. I think, I think you just gotta literally step out uh, as you said, of that environment and look at you know, it a different it's, way. It's interesting. Um, there's a there's a word that's really commonly associated with negotiation, and that is tactics. That word tactics, um, and tactics are just behaviors that we adopt that often in a negotiation situation raise or lower our expectations about how things are going to turn out. So, um, and these tactics. It's my view anyway. We, we each have two or three that we always use in mm. negotiations. Sometimes for some people it may be getting aggressive. You know, I'm going to go in this and I'm going to lean way in and stomp over everyone. For others it might be getting very passive or um, retreating from conflict. Um, for others it may be, you know, appearing bored or, you know, whatever. Or, or laughing at certain things to, ha, ah, you're kidding, you really think that's worth, you know, all kinds of things. And I cover this idea of tactics around the idea of managing tension. Hmm. And so becoming aware of those physical tactics that you use all the time is part of, of raising your awareness and helping you release yourself from the, the, the binds of those things. Uh -huh. You can also see them in others. Certain people have different things that have always worked for them, uh -huh. and um, they blind us to hearing and uh, listening more effectively and, and understanding the broader context. So all of that to say is that we're sometimes even locked in our own bodies. Uh -huh. mm. as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking sort of there's the black and there's the white, but there's all that stuff in the middle that we just don't. You uh, should become an expert in grays. Yes. Yeah, in gray. Yes. Trust me. Kind of I like am. your shirt, Mark. And yeah, like this <laughs> part of my. <laughs> I am getting better and better at it. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's a sort of um. I think it's possible, and even for inexperienced negotiators to to seek out the gray, it's not a private reserve of the wise. Um, it happens to the wise a little more quickly perhaps or perhaps less destructively but I think even if you're 
you're just starting out or experiencing negotiating important things to you for the first time, uh, fantastic. You can start off properly instead of getting wound into old habits. Mm. So there, there's hope for all of us. It's never, ever um, too late to, to introduce clarification in your life on so many different levels. I just happened to pick negotiation because it's a hot topic for people. It is. Um, and it's just something that if we can get this and do this a little better, there's big wins at the other end of it for us. Mm. You know, it's a big snowball negotiation. <clears throat> If somebody asks, would ask me, oh, what did you talk about in this meeting? I just can tell them, oh, I heard a interesting new story uh, of a book describing a new way to wisdom. A new way, sorry, Mark, I, that to wisdom. Way to, to, another to wisdom, another approach. Yeah to wisdom because uh, if I take the things really deep yeah. in, in, into their depths di dimension, uh, we are talking about walking into a space where wisdom is more important. And uh, this can change really a lot of our uh, world which is lost in wrong fights. Yeah. Yes. And and it's not too late for some of these more complex fights, even on our personal level or, or on a global level. What's lacking is the character to stop and clarify. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or even the, the permission uh, to do that. But I have hope because if we can create an army of of uh, people who are 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 winning differently, um, then I think that, that we'll we'll do well, and it's just more satisfying because of the people that I'm working with, my students and my, my clients, are getting results and better results, and even more importantly, results they didn't expect hmm. by using a tool they already have in them. It gives them huge amplitude for power that is is um, empathetic and humble but yet um, very direct so um, yes it, it, negotiation is a good vehicle to use that uh, because it's so sorely lacking and it's the opportunity to take more people by surprise by doing it so right now there's a bandwidth of opportunity that you can use hmm. by applying it to negotiation. Yeah, that's a really good point. If you go into a negotiation knowing this, 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 and this, and this is how far this is what I want, and that's how far I'm going to get, you you are missing that potential for surprise, where where you, if you hmm. took in information, um, you might. You're, you're right. And yeah. you're, you're missing that opportunity for, for surprise, yes, but for discovery. Yeah, discovery Even better. better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't want to also give the impression that we need to forget about the old BATNA, which is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement, which is really just you asking yourself, what do I what do I want from this really and being very honest because the baton is critical it's it's you listing your alternatives it's you evaluating what options you want out of something I mean and and where you will actually walk away the problem with the batna and the training are most of our training in batna so far is that we do it for ourselves hmm. we need to do it for the people we're negotiating with and that's the key difference that clarification will bring to you is you need to know what you can give but also what you can get and very often uh, sneaking clarification will change the way that looks and cut the time down and everybody will feel a little bit better as a result so it, it isn't getting rid of the edginess of you know we still have two people or two groups who value things differently absolutely no doubt and each one wants to feel like 
they got what they came for and they want to look good when they go back and tell their friends about what happened. Um, and all that's still there at the start. And you need to be prepared for that. And in the book I've given you tools for, for preparation. You know, what are the people that are doing well actually doing to prepare? Mm -hmm. And so those, those we can't get rid of. But there is this additional thing, again, that we already all have. Um, that's about just sort of lifting it out and using it. And knowing that the research supports you too. The research will support you seeking clarification. So oh. there. So there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kelly, do you have anything before I continue on? Oh, just because yeah. you're, you're awfully quiet today. I don't know what it is. I don't know. It's just rainy and blah. Oh, but, I'm um, sorry. <laughs> I hate to tell you, it's really sunny here in California. I'm sorry, Kelly. <laughs> But it's, it's like that all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's not like that very often here. <laughs> so, well, I was wondering, There's, it, you're right, it is a hot topic right now. There are a lot of books when you go on Amazon and type in negotiator, negotiator. And what's different about Nimble Negotiator to the other new books that are out there? Yeah. And, and I'm glad there's a lot of books out there um, because it's a subject we need to talk about. And there are some... Some, some good ones as well. Um, I think that the thing that's, that's most different, and I, I, take, I take a message from my clients and my students on this in terms of what's different, is that it is a, a perspective on negotiation that releases you from the old school, first of all. Um, and I think it, it, it really does reflect um, where the next thing is going. There's a, a number of um, um, if you look uh, again at, at Harvard's, I would say, and I look just to back this up, probably top their top 10 deals of 2013 and 2014, all of them, bar one or two, were sorted out through um, a better planning and rapport building and conversations prior to doing the deal. They're actually making a big deal of discussing it and saying, hey, this was different about this. They didn't have to beat each other up. They actually talked to each other beforehand and settled things beforehand. So there is, a, there is something about bringing the reader into that space, I think, in a way that's friendly and clear and doable. That's the great thing. It, it's not very highfalutin. Um, it's practical and useful and says, hey, yeah, I kind of already do that. Or, gee, if I adjusted my approach this way or I'm going to take a deep breath, and step right into asking, what do you mean by that exactly? Or what do you want from this? Or, you know, how would you feel this whole thing was successful? And I show you how to do that. So number one, it allows you to enter that next space uh, in a way that's practical and, and useful. The second thing that it does, and I think a lot of other books do, but I, I quite like this because I've used these tools for years. Um, and I give you ways to actually go about fixing that physical that we talked about, those physical habits, and giving you some tools that you can use that will help you prepare better. I actually give you questions that you can ask um, in your reconnaissance conversations. I help you how you know, give you what what does what comes out of my mouth when I do an opening position. When I go first, what do I say? Or even what happens when I go second? Is that okay? And if so, what comes out of my mouth? So it's like one of those things that you can you can sort of go like this. You know, oh okay, hang on a minute. Let me just let me just check. And you can write in it and scribble in it. So it's it's even built like something you can stick into your <laughs> I like to be in people's pocket bucks and stick them in your purse or whatever. So it's it's a useful little little friend uh, to have. So I think primarily it's getting your head around those things and then having some really practical tools for making it happen. So I would say that's a promise about it. Not a lot of new news in the world, but it's always the way it's put together. And, and I bring my particular voice to that. Right. And, all right, in the uh, interest of quick fix society here, <laughs> what is the most important, quickest one thing that somebody can step out right now and to improve the bleh, to improve their negotiation skills besides speaking yeah. clearly <laughs> and you know what i would say count to 10 ah. count to 10 that 
That is a really good tip. I, that's, not, that's not sexy or interesting, but you know what? I, I trust that if you pause with intention, that you put in your heart that you want to clarify what's actually happening here, and you take a deep breath, and and I say count to ten, I say that because we know, you know, in other words, find that moment of grace, that will make the biggest difference to your negotiations. <laughs> I, I think that's yeah. excellent because it's, it's so hard, but easy. it is the one thing I'd ask you to do if there was just one. Mm -hmm. That's just something my mother would do when she was angry. She would tell us, I'm going to count to ten. Uh, and then what happened? She's a little bit nicer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I promise that, that when you're standing in a situation or you're being confronted with a situation and you intend to find this grace, this little bit of space, I know you'll find it because even if the answer is, I don't know the answer to this, that's the answer. And that's okay. I just trust that you will find it. And I think, you know, part of what's happening in our world is we've kind of lost how to trust ourselves, um, particularly in situations where we're being confronted and our past comes flooding and our, our future comes flooding towards us and all these things get tied up. You know, let it go. Find that, find that 10 seconds of grace and I think things will be off on the right start. And, and I think things have changed a lot in the last 20 years. When I started working 20 years ago, you only had to know so much, and you knew it, and, and you didn't say, I don't know. You're expected to know, and now there's so much, there's no way you could know it. I mean, there's just no way you can know everything. There's too much information. Um, you have to say, I don't know, once in a while. Well, no, and you're right, Billy, because it, you know, it's, it's more authentic to do it that way, and it's, it's true, and it, it's, it's um, the reality of our complex world is that we need each other and it's um, a lot smarter just to hold that space and it's okay to say no. In fact, it's important. Yeah. You can ask Michael if 50% of the time she asks me something, the answer is I don't know. But I'll try to find out. Oh yeah, you yeah. do. Absolutely. That's okay. But I don't know. That's a good thing. Yeah. Good for you. And the same applies to negotiation. It's so often so much time, effort, and soul is wasted on the fight. Yeah. So we need to change that energy around a little bit, give you some tools to clarify, uh, give, you, give you a stake in the ground around clarification with the promise that it does work, and, and give you some things. You know, you're still negotiating with people. You know, for the rest of our lives, we'll negotiate with people who still are back in the old school. So here's some tools in here to help you deal with them, too. Hmm. Don't worry about that. Yeah, T 10 seconds, as you said, to start. I think that's yep. excellent. Yep. And, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about, I mean, I thought about having it here on the bookshelf to kind of reference. But, you know, I do carry around quite a large bag. Um, I, I think I am going to have uh, <laughs> to add that to my bag. Um, because it'll it fit. up really small. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it makes an excellent telescope. <laughs> it does. And it makes an excellent hat. I yeah. got this one in Paris. So. It's lovely. It's lovely. But I think, I mean, you're, you're right. Just to be able to flip through there and remind yourself, you know, just, just to have the confidence that, you know, I, I can do this thing. Yeah, if, and if it's not, okay. You'll figure it out. You'll figure yeah. it out. And you won't go in sloppy because, again, that's part of a... Um, it's never easy to be easy, is it? It's always yeah. a little more work. Yeah, you're right. And there yeah. and there, you have a lovely bumper sticker. <laughs> it's never easy to be easy. Hey, that's right. That. <laughs> and that's we'll right. Don't be fooled. That. Don't yeah. be fooled. It's actually that's a right. lot of work. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and well. I really appreciate this opportunity um, to speak with you and your readers. And I appreciate you, Mark, um, joining in as well from Germany. It's always nice to uh, have had a little cover. I, you know? I think we need this kind of making use of technologies to get that kind of worldwide understanding. And this is just a simple example that this can work. Hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. and, 
And if you haven't read this book, um, put it on that list or what the hey, go crazy and buy it now um, because there it is, it's available. Although I really would like to have it on audio if you could do something about that. Oh, that's good, I'll think, talk to you about it. That's a great idea. Yeah, because I think it would be that's really helpful idea. to have this have this in my head, you know, because everybody learns differently. That's an awesome idea. I'll look into that. Super. Well, anything else? Mark, Kelly? Thank I appreciate you. Making time. All right. Well, Juliet, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed uh, spending this time with you. And thank you for the book. I know that I am going to make use of this time and time again. It's so, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. So let's negotiate sometime. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let's clarify that. About what? <laughs> oh, heck, I don't know. Yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever you want. I'm totally here for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you take care. Thanks, Thank everyone. You so much. See you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.